So we're here at the NanoSys here in the Silicon Valley, and uh, who are you? I'm Jason Hartlow, President and CEO of NanoSys. So uh, NanoSys is the quantum dot company, right? That's right. We provide quantum dots to every consumer brand, uh, product in the world that's out there today. We have close to 100% market share. All of the products that you're seeing with quantum dots, QLED, uh, PQ Vision, all of these various different brandings that you see out there, uh, P-Series Quantum from uh, Vizio, all of these products are using the materials that we developed and manufacture right here at, at Nanosys. So right here in this building? Yeah, right here in this building. It's happening right here, it's there's some machines? It's right now, even as we speak, yes. Uh, some pretty big machines? Some pretty good sized machines, yeah. Um, that, are, that are designed in a way to do a mass production of nanotechnology, right? That's right, so we're producing nanocrystals, very, very small, two nanometers to maybe five nanometers or eight nanometers in diameter, each individual crystal. And we produce these on a scale of hundreds of gallons of material is being produced at a time. So it's really just a phenomenal thing. It's beyond kind of our comprehension of how many particles there are within one of our reactors, for example. It's literally billions of billions of billions, something like 10 to the 24th particles are in one of our reactors at any given time and we're precisely controlling the atomic level growth of these crystals so that they're all growing to within a few atoms of each other in terms of their size. So very, very uniform across population and very, very common in terms of the light that they give out. They make use of an effect called the quantum confinement effect, which is where we basically have an exciton or an energy source coming into the, to the crystal that's absorbed by the crystal and then the uh, exciton is split into an electron hole pair and after they recombine the amount of energy that the electron hole pair have is limited by the quantum confinement or the actual Bohr radius physical size of the particle. So as a result we can excite these crystals for example with a blue light and then we can down convert that energy to green light, perfect green light or perfect red light etc. And so in that way, we're able to create the perfect spectrum of red, green, and blue light, just right for making great color displays, perfect uh, high resolution, perfect for the high resolution uh, products and high definition um, products that are out there today. So it's not just about doing more colors, it's about doing better colors? Yeah, it's really about how do we improve the color purity. So, of course, the color accuracy is important. So color accuracy refers to our ability to put the wavelength of color exactly in the right place where the primary is located. So for every one of our video spaces, for example, DCI-P3 is a common video standard, there's an ideal primary location. And so there's an ideal place where the green wavelength should be. But in addition to having it properly located at that perfect primary, we also want to have a very narrow green. We don't want to have a big, broad, wide green because then it starts to look more yellowish to the eye. It starts to pick up some more of the red and some more of the blue, and this is just really, you know, distorts our perception of the purity of that color. And so by having these perfect primaries, uh, the overall color fidelity of the system can really be improved. So um, uh, is this the biggest mass production of nanotechnology in the world? So as far as we know, this is the biggest production of nanotechnology that's used for any kind of what I would call electronic application. Um, there are uh, large-scale nanomaterials which are produced perhaps at larger scales that are used for things like uh, cosmetics and paints, uh, but these are not what we would call active materials. Our crystals, our semiconductor materials, are very active crystals. They're light emitting. They absorb energy from one wavelength and emit at a different wavelength. This makes them very different than, for example, the materials that are used in, in cosmetics or in colorants, where you're basically making use of the size effect purely from a, a physical standpoint, not from an electrical or optical standpoint. So nanotechnology is some of the most cutting edge kind of science uh, or technology out there, right? And so you're at the forefront of that? And it's the first that, you know, this, you need so much of it. There's so many TVs. Yeah, it's the first real large-scale deployment of a nanotechnology, nanocrystal technology in uh, electronics. That's correct. Crystal in nano size. Yes. Yeah. And, 
so there's crystal and LCD, but you're doing some different kind of crystals. Yeah, so the liquid crystal material is actually not really a crystal. It's actually a molecule. Um, and so that's, that's a, kind of a, a little bit of a, an architect, or a leftover of the, the naming convention for LCD, uh, liquid crystal display. So the, uh, the difference is we're not making a molecular arrangement, we're making a semiconductor particle. Um, and so this is done with very high temperature processes. The materials are brought together and annealed into these perfect little semiconductor cores, which we then surround with uh, an offset type uh, semiconductor for a, a shell to further confine the, the uh, wave function of the particle. So uh, right here, there's a, a quantum.tv. So how many uh, billions or trillions are there on the screen, for example? Yeah, so that's a, it's a really great question. Um, it's kind of hard to, to rationalize that. So uh, in this screen, we might have something like about half a gram of quantum dot material. Um, but the, um, but each quantum dot is weighing so small amounts, right? I mean, we're talking about nanograms or femtograms. So there are, again, there are billions and billions and billions of particles in this uh, single sheet right here. All of them very uniform, all emitting this perfect red, green, blue spectrum of light, um, which results in a, in a really beautiful uh, color spectrum and, and color reproduction of this set. When we look at this and we compare, for example, in this scene here, this is what we call a Macbeth chart. The Macbeth chart color accuracy is really one of the key things that people look at. This is a, a standard test diagram or test pattern uh, that has the various different color patches on there. And you can measure using a meter exactly how accurate uh, this set is in terms of reproducing those colors. And you find that it's, it's very, very accurate compared to any other set that's out there on the market today. So only half a gram, that means you spread it out very, very it's not very like thin. thinner than the butter and bread. It's Absolutely. like, it's very thin. Very, very thin. And, it, uh, and then there's billions and each of these particles are exactly the same? Exactly the same. How do you make something that's where everything is so small and exactly the same? That's the miracle of our uh, development uh, the work that we've done here is really what we call chemical self-assembly. And so, you know, we have obviously people who work here in the, in the facility, uh, people in the manufacturing area who run the reactions, but really at the end of the day what's happening is each one of the atoms that's going into each one of these crystals is being self-assembled into these little tiny crystals by other molecules that we've designed in the reaction. And so this chemical self-assembly process is what allows us to basically put these little crystals together so perfectly and control how uniform they are across such a wide, such a huge, like incomprehensibly large number of particles that are being synthesized at any given time. It sounds like you're saying the small little atoms are like little workers that are making sure they, put, they go in the right place? The molecules are little workers that are depositing the atoms in the right place. That's right. That's a good, good analogy for it. Molecules of, of what? Um, so, for example, there are different types of salts and acids and other types of, of molecules that we use that help uh, to put the, the donor atom. So, for example, a metal ion, for example, a, an indium ion. They'll put that in just the right place together with a phosphorus ion, and that'll come together and form an indium phosphide cluster. And then we'll start to see additional little molecules come along and deposit their indium and their phosphorus together with that little cluster that's already formed, and we we'll start to grow an indium phosphide little crystal. And that's basically progresses. And a large, you know, many people maybe did uh, crystal growth when they were kids, you know, in the, with the sugar water or other types of, of crystal growth. It's, it's a similar kind of concept to that. You basically have a saturated uh, solution and you have these crystals that want to form as a result of the way you put the overall system together. And I would guess there's some parts that you kind of have to scrub out, but you have to take it all out, if otherwise it's not going to be good? Yeah, so what we do is after we synthesize the, the crystal, those little worker molecules that we've got, 
those are byproducts. So we have to clean those. Those are not going to be light emitting. They're not going to help in any way uh, the quality of the end product that we're making. So we have a, a cleaning process, a washing process, where we remove, we separate those, again, very, very small, two nanometer size particles from these very small little molecules that we use to uh, help facilitate the reaction. And then we have the clean, you know, cores, uh, as we call them, and then we're going to take those and we're going to do another process operation on them. We're going to wrap them in each, each individual core is going to be wrapped with an epitaxially matched semiconductor shell. So now we've got a little binary system with a core material and a shell material around it. And that's going to provide us with this very high efficiency little light engine um, that we've got that's going to emit those perfect colors. So how clean does it get? Because are there still some of these not so good molecules at the end of the thing yeah. or they're all gone? Yeah, they're all gone. They're yeah. just all gone? Yeah. Even though it's so tiny, you just know that they go? Yeah. I mean, we, we know by means of all of our chemical analysis, all of our various different optical analysis, we can look for trace presence of any impurities and all of that stuff. And so these are truly electronic grade materials um, that, that do not have any of those byproducts left in them. So is nanotechnology is just uh, it's kind of like chemistry? Nanotechnology, in terms of the synthesis process, is really about cutting edge chemistry. Um, but the interesting thing about nanotechnology is it's kind of it's cross disciplinary, and so a lot of the things that I'm telling you about are have to do with solid state physics and electrical engineering, as well as you know the synthetic elements which are coming from chemistry. So really in our company, we have people from all different backgrounds working across these different disciplines to design the right materials, to come up with the ideas for how to choose the right band gaps of materials, people working on how we can actually do synthesis using those materials, and then ultimately how those materials integrate into devices like the quantum dot film that you see here in these uh, commercial televisions. So um, in two or three years, it's going to be a 20-year anniversary, right, the company? But uh, yeah. this, this was invented a little bit before. Yeah. And, uh, but to get all this to work, uh, it's not a, so easy, right? So that's why you're the yeah. world leader. Nobody else can get to do it's this? Been, it's been a very, very uh, uh, rigorous uh, development process to get to a point where these materials could not only emit the light that was necessary with the high efficiency, but also have the stability. So one thing about nanomaterials is that uh, there's just many, many forces in nature um, which generally tend to oppose the nano effects. And so it's difficult to get the nanoscale effect to still be present when you have a large ensemble of these materials. For example, people have tried for a long time to do something that's called the gecko adhesive effect. And this is where geckos, little lizards, have these little tiny hairs on their feet. And they're actually able, because of a very high surface area effect, they're actually able to grip onto the side of a wall and climb up. The problem is when we try and replicate that with nanofibers, because they are nanoscale fibers on the gecko's feet, the problem is that those fibers will get fouled by things in the environment, dust, dirt, oil, whatever. And then pretty soon they just become a little clump and they no longer have that high surface area effect. The gecko solves that problem because he's a biological organism. He's continually regenerating new little nanofibers on his feet, but we can't do that. So we can make a, a material that's very sticky, no adhesive, but it sticks perfectly, just like the gecko's feet, but the minute that it comes in contact with any contamination or other things, it starts to lose that adhesive ability. So a key thing for quantum dots was how, did, how could we take these materials and put them into a form factor where they did not immediately lose their light emitting capability, become quenched uh, by environment, by other materials that might be in the systems, et cetera. So making them robust so that they could be used in commercial applications, last for 50,000 hours in a television application, et cetera, 
this was where a lot of time and energy was spent with these materials. So that took like a decade to figure that out? It took about a decade to figure that out. When I joined the company in 2008, um, what we had was basically this uh, kind of a material. So we had, this is just a demo, this is uh, green quantum dots in, um, in, in a solution. And so you can see that these, uh, you know, they, they don't look like much, but when we put them over a blue light source, um, we can get this very perfect pure green color that's emitted by them. To go from that, though, which is liquid in a bottle, into a television is a big step. And so what we had to do was come up with a way to integrate those materials into a television manufacturing process that was cost effective and maintained all of that lifetime and all those other characteristics that was necessary. And ultimately what we came up with was a film concept. And so this is the film that's actually used in that television that we're talking, that we saw earlier. This is a quantum dot enhancement film. And what it is, is it's a very, very thin layer of that nanomaterial, the quantum dots, um, dispersed between two sheets of plastic with some resin to give it a little stability. And this is a very robust implementation. This can last for you know, many, many years in the TV application and uh, actually outlasts a lot of the other components. So that's what you call QDEF? This is QDEF, quantum dot enhancement film. And this is, uh, this is it, it, it feels it's, it's, not, it's not just a sheet of plastic. That's what I kind of thought, but it's much more complicated than just a sheet of transparent yeah. plastic. So um, this is an example of what we have here, um, a couple little things that, that I'm going to show you. Um, this is a little handheld spectrometer. And so what it allows us to do is actually measure the spectra of light that's emitted from any given source. Um, and so what I'm going to do with this guy is I'm going to show you kind of what a normal white uh, backlight would look like in an LCD. So this is, this is built using white LEDs. This is a conventional backlight panel. And so behind that set, there is this white light. And then there's a modulator in front of it, which flickers each individual pixel on and off. But ultimately, the source of the light is coming from here. So when we look at the spectra of that light source, and we look specifically at it, oops, we see that we have a very, very broad peak uh, here, which is containing green and yellow and orange and red. So there isn't a distinct green and red peak. As a result of that, in order to make a red and green color channel at the television level, we have to filter out all of that yellow content, get rid of it, basically. Terribly inefficient. And as a result, the, re the resulting peaks that we get aren't very sharp. They aren't very well defined. On the other hand, if we take our quantum dot film, we use a blue backlight, blue LEDs, which are basically the same LEDs as are used in the white, just without the so-called YAG uh, phosphor material, which converts the blue light into that yellow light. We take that blue light source, we put one of our quantum dot films into the backlight unit, and now we've got this perfect uh, light for making perfect red, green, and blue. Again, we take the spectral meter, and we see that the peaks are very, very sharply and well-defined. So now, your green subpixel is going to have a green color that looks like that, your red is going to have a red that looks like that, and your blue is going to have a blue that looks like that very sharp, very perfect primaries. And we can see that when we look at one of those sets. So for example, if we come over here, take a look at one of these white areas, which has all three colors. Again, we can see that we've got that perfect red, green, blue uh, in terms of color. Now, if we look at an OLED set, which is using an alternative type of lighting technology, we can see that, again, we're back to having this very messy primary system. And so, the green and the red are not well defined. As a result, you don't get the ability to paint your color palette perfectly. If you have perfect primaries, you can paint all of the colors in between perfectly with your color rendering. But so, so, if you have messy primaries, you're going to wind up with messy colors in between. So why the OLED can't figure this out? Well, the, the emission technology, the light emitting technology used for the OLED is, is quite broad in terms of uh, the spectrum that they that they have to, to live with. Um, so 
it's a, a real fundamental limit of the OLED materials. And then the, at the SID Display Week, uh, with, together with Samsung, you're showing the QDOG, you call it. Right, right. So this is a, an enhancement to this um, quantum dot film, whereby instead of uh, just having a, a sheet of film that goes into an integrated assembly, uh, it's one part of a multi-part assembly, we actually have the entire backlight um, uh, light guide plate, we call it, in one piece. And so this one piece light guide plate has the quantum dot uh, material uh, directly deposited on it. So in, in this assembly, um, if we look inside of here, we've got a couple of, of plastic sheets. Um, on, we've got this piece of plastic, which is transmitting the light. We've then got this, and then we've got some other optical films that are, that are stuck on top of here in order to render the, the perfect uh, color and, and brightness coming out. This eliminates all of those other uh, components and as a result can improve the overall thickness of the set tremendously. The other thing that's great about it is it's dimensionally very stable. Being glass, this allows us to uh, drive this with very, very, very bright light and not have to worry about the plastic becoming deformed as a result of the high temperatures that are associated with driving this with extremely bright light. And as we move towards 8K, the pixel aperture ratio in 8K goes down and you need brighter and brighter light sources in your backlight in order to maintain brightness at the front of the screen. So we think that the QD on glass is gonna be a really important technology for 8K um, and uh, we're very excited to be working on that. And at uh, CES, I saw an amazing demo. I think Sony was showing 10,000 nits, uh, some crazy bright displays. It's also great, even 4K, to have crazy bright displays. It, it makes you suddenly feel like you're out, outdoors. Yeah, this effect of uh, really having a lifelike brightness uh, can't be understated in terms of the, the viewing experience. It goes from being the difference, really, of of looking at what you know is just kind of television to almost like you're looking out the window at an actual outdoor scene, right? The specular reflections off of shiny surfaces, the way the sunlight glints, the way backlight happens, all of this with high dynamic range, with very high brightness, is extremely compelling in terms of visual experience. And when you see skies, when you see outdoor scenes, it's just like, wow. It looks outdoors. It doesn't look like a, you know, when you see the sun, it sort of, it looks like the sun. It doesn't look like a, a little gray ball or orange ball kind of, you know, that's dimmer than the, the house lights that you have in your room. So, yeah, brightness is very, very compelling. Uh, obviously, we want to do that in a very energy efficient way. Uh, also, the, uh, the dynamic range or the contrast between those very, very bright brights and dark darks is also very critical. And, the, and, and then you also have something coming up. So you, you're doing a, 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 this one, which is yeah, so also is, compatible with the, with the OLED? Yeah, so this is a, a way in which OLED can improve its color rendering capability. So for example, um, that you can make, uh, these are, this blue light is generated by conventional blue LEDs. Um, and then they go into a plastic panel and then the light's uh, coming out this way. However, you could also make a blue OLED um, instead of a blue LED source. And so if you were to do that and then you were to put um, individual uh, chips or individual little patterns of um, quantum dot material on top of it, then you would be able to basically come up with a rendering of very perfect, again, red and green. And so now you can imagine that these are the subpixels in your set. And so instead of having uh, that spectrum that you had there, which was, you know, as we could see from the OLED, very wide, your blue subpixel would look like this, so very narrow. Your red subpixel would look very red, and your green subpixel would look very green. And so this is a way in which we can combinatorially uh, put together the red quantum dots, green quantum dots, with the blue OLED emission, and make the so-called QD OLED hybrid device, 
um, which is very exciting in terms of color performance, brightness performance, and really bringing OLED to the next level. So bringing OLED to the next level, but also LCD to the next level? Well, LCD definitely is, is also already coming to the next level thanks to things like quantum dot enhancement film and QD on glass. Um, LCD and OLED each have some advantages um, and they each have you know, some demerits as well. So as, as you well know, uh, LCD is, is well-established technology. It's very low cost and the capacity and the ability to make large panels is very good. Uh, whereas OLED is just an emerging technology today and doesn't have those kind of benefits, but it does have extremely good black levels, um, which is a which is a benefit. So you're definitely going to be partnering with the OLED industry. We're partnering with the OLED industry, LCD industry, micro LEDs, any kind of display technology that's out there that's developing or is already in the market. We're partnering with how we can use and integrate quantum dots into their devices to help make more perfect colors, more beautiful color palettes, and more efficiency coming out of those systems. And then there's another thing that's coming up is the emitting one. Yeah, so these are self-emitting crystals. And so when we uh, think about what I said earlier, how quantum dots can be uh, made to emit light by stimulating them uh, with an external photon, like a blue photon, and then they re-emit in their various different colors based on their size. We can also stimulate them electrically, and so we can directly pump the uh, quantum dot materials with electrons and holes and cause them to emit. And so that's what's shown in this demo. This is electrically pumped uh, red, green, and blue cadmium-free quantum dots uh, with very high efficiency, um, and eventually those will be used and patterned as pixels down on uh, substrates to, to form the display. Is it together with the micro LED or something different? That, that would be completely self-emitting, so there wouldn't be any micro LED or OLED material in that system. But that's some number of years away before that system will have the stability uh, to be able to meet the consumer requirements. Today, these materials have relatively short lifetimes, and so they wouldn't be good for a consumer product. And, and how far is this one? This technology the market? with the uh, color converter, I think, is you know, easily coming to market within 18 months perhaps less. Uh, the quantum dot materials for this are ready and available today, and so it's really a question of the integration scheme and how that happens at our customer site. QD on glass has already uh, been shown, as you know, at SID, and so probably coming to market very soon. And quantum dot enhancement film uh, is out there in millions of TVs today already, and uh, that just continues to grow in terms of the number of sets that are sold annually with quantum dot film. So potentially 2020, 2021, you'll be in the majority of all new TVs that get sold? or Certainly we think the majority of all TVs at or above the sort of $500 to $800 price point. So. Cool. All right. And thanks a lot. Thank you. And maybe in the future, it'd be great to see your giant machines, but maybe not we'll today. see. Okay, yeah. not today. Thanks, thanks a lot. lot. Thank all you. Right.